Welcome to the Q&A Cafe uh, here today, as always, from the Georgetown Club in Georgetown, where we're very happy to be. And um, uh, very happy to welcome Susan Page as our guest. I always like to point out the, the, the day and time in which we're doing these, because uh, they air forever, I'm happy to say. <laughs> but uh, as it is, this is a cold, wet, rainy day in Washington, and it's also the eve of House impeachment mm -hmm. hearings, because we like to put a little time stamp on it. But um, we're going to talk about a lot of things, and uh, including impeachment and the hearings, and you. Uh, Susan is here in part because she's uh, published this bestseller on Barbara Bush, The Matriarch. And um, she's working now on Nancy Pelosi mm -hmm. and but you're still you're still writing the book, right? It's oh, I'm still reporting the book. So if anyone here has any information about <laughs> any Nancy, Nancy Pelosi, <laughs> any great Nancy Pelosi stories, I am definitely in the market. And what it, do you have? Yeah, do, yeah, she, do you have, really? Yeah, well, do you okay. have a pub date? I do, but it's a secret. Okay, well that's like fair anonymous. Enough. But the, well, there you the go. And street, if you yes. want to tell us the identity of anonymous, <laughs> you're welcome to do that. I think everybody in town wants to know who that is. I think is. everyone has a theory, but they differ. Do you have a top three choices? So when this airs, if it'll come out next week, I and this will uh, air next week, you know, and we'll could, know whether you're right? It could be out by then, so I think yeah. that sounds very risky. What yeah. if I'm wrong? Whatever it is, just assume that was what I was thinking. OK, yeah. exactly. It could be. Do you think there's any chance it could be more than one person? No. OK, so we, we've narrowed it down to one person. I, I think so, because uh, you know they haven't told us much. No. But they said it's a senior administration official. That doesn't mean necessarily a White House official. Could be, but might be somebody. Administration's fast. That's right. right. Uh, and they've identified it as a single author. So I take that at their word. And um, we assume this person is still working in the administration. It's not a former, right? I don't think we assume that. Uh, we Could it we, be a former? It could be a former. It could be a current. When, the, when that New York Times op-ed ran it was a, a little over a year ago in September of 2018, at that point, the author was described as a current administration official, right. but I don't believe that is, I don't believe they're using that description anymore. Because a current administration official, if they were to come out with this book, that would be difficult, right? I you mean, there'd be smoking a, out going on everywhere. Even a former senior, think about it, a senior administration official, it's clear from the book, this is a person who was in meetings with Trump, small meetings with President Trump. Think about that, writing a book during his presidency that mm. describes him in such a scathing way. I just don't know if we've ever had a situation like this before. Uh, I don't know that we have, but I think lots of people are working on books all the time yes. who are in high profile positions in yes. Washington. Um, I'll tell you who my nominee is. Yes, and then, I mean, because I, you know, what do I care? I mean, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I've often felt it was Don McGahn. Ah, could be the lawyer, the former yeah, White House counsel. Right, right, right. Yes. Uh, very privy mm -hmm. to quite a lot <laughs> and spanning a significant amount of time and um, never seemed to be completely at peace yes. with what was going on. So you take Don McGahn and I'll take everyone else. Okay. <laughs> okay, my shame will be, I don't mind being wrong. I'm wrong about a lot of things and then every now and then I'm, I'm right. Um, let's just go a year from now, mm -hmm. for, just for the fun of it. What do you think we'll be looking back at right now about this moment. Do you think, I mean, do you think, I mean, you and I both and many people here have been through the impeachment. Uh, well, we've been through Nixon, but then also Clinton. Clinton was impeached in the House and that was as far as it went. The expectation is that will be the same with Trump. But will this, will this be a seismic changing moment or will this just happen and we'll just go right back on to the way we've been with the Trump administration so far, just adapting and moving on to the next moment? I think this is a, a big moment. I think this is a big week, actually, um, with the public hearings beginning mm -hmm. tomorrow um, and the effort by House Democrats to portray a narrow, understandable narrative mm -hmm. about what happened with President Trump and the President of Ukraine and U.S. military aid. Uh, I think there's been a great effort, um, sh shepherded by Nancy Pelosi, to not make it bigger into other issues that some Democrats would like to impeach the president about, and to not make it more complicated, to keep it simple. And you see that with their choice of uh, witnesses, mm -hmm. a few witnesses, career people, not partisan people. And if they succeed uh, in doing that, 
that could have big effects. Mm -hmm. That could have effects on people who voted for President Trump uh, in 2016. It could have effects on how the government, I mean, it just, you could just see it unfolding um, in many ways, even if what we think, what, what we, the conventional wisdom is almost always wrong. But as you say, the conventional wisdom is the Democratic controlled House votes to impeach mm. President Trump. The That's Republican a given, controlled, right? It's, it's basically a given. Mm. The Republican controlled Senate declines to convict him. Right. So he stays in office. And this happens pretty quickly. We know the House wants to act by the end of the year. I think that Mitch McConnell has indicated he'd like a quick trial, not an extended one, and we go back to the 2020 election. So in some ways, it may not be the decisive issue in 2020. Yeah. People tend to vote but it will on happen. issues. But it's going to happen, and it's so rare in our history. It, this would only be the would this be the third time? This would be only the third time the House and we've had voted been alive for all of them. And we've been, yeah. That, well, that well. No, I'm thinking because on, on Nixon there was never a vote of impeachment. Oh, he resigned. He resigned before. in advance yeah, of impeachment. But it was so unless you were around for Andrew uh, Johnson. Oh right, Jackson, right, right. And, uh, no, 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 no. no, yeah, no yeah, I, I'll own that I wasn't. But um, but it's a very it's a rare and historic moment. How is this different from the Russia hearings and the Mueller mm -hmm. hearings? How is it different? Well, for one thing, uh, we started out with this smoking gun tape, right? Mm -hmm. The very first thing we got practically, we got the whistleblower report, and the White House almost immediately put out the, the summary of his conversation mm -hmm. um, with the Ukrainian president. And in Democratic minds, that makes the case. What we're doing, well, the, their other efforts are to provide context mm -hmm. um, for that summary of that phone call, which is one reason it's been able to move so quickly. This has been moved with unbelievable speed. Mueller, in contrast, was done mostly in private, the Mueller investigation mostly in private, and the Mueller investigation was complicated. Like all those Russian names who could keep them straight. <laughs> right. And what was, was there really collusion? And when it happened, the biggest A lot of the Ukraine names aren't that much Aren't that much easier. Yeah. When it happened, Trump was not president. He was a candidate. Maybe people were willing to cut him a little more slack. This is, this is simple. It's during his presidency. It is. Uh, it, we're going to find out what Americans think about it with these hearings. It's interesting, though, that we've had these two major episodes, investigatory episodes, within just three years no. of an administration. Well, what an what an administration we've had. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, this is the sixth president I've covered, and I've just never covered anything like it. It's like every it's, day, major revelations on things that make your jaw drop. Do you feel that you ever get out in front of it? Or do you feel you're always chasing it? Always chasing it. And we've had to, you know, as journalists, we've had to change how we operate. Mm -hmm. I mean, for one thing, at USA Today, we expanded our White House team because we were killing our White House team. They were working so hard. We started a shift that begins at 6 a.m. and one that goes to 11 p.m. because he tweets at all hours. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't ask the people working during the day to start that early or finish that late. Um, we've also had to become more disciplined in not always fo following the shiny object. Yeah. Um, because that's we, hard, it's hard to do. If the president tweets something that's very provocative, you can't ignore it. Mm -hmm. But you can't only do that. Yeah. You have to always also do the things that require more time and are harder to do. And so we've had to try to work as an industry, both mm -hmm. as at my publication, but also just as the news industry in general. We've had to figure out how to cover someone who's unlike anyone we've covered before. Um, just. You're mentioning USA Today. Does the White House subscribe? Have they kept the subscription? <laughs> or did they cancel you along with the New York Times and the Washington Post? Uh, so far Post? as I know. <laughs> You're yes, still there. Yeah, so as far as I know, we're still How there. long have you been with USA Today? I've been with USA Today since 1995. And they started in what? In the 1980s. 80s, right. Yeah. And where were you before that? I worked for Newsday, yeah. the newspaper in New York. Yeah. And uh, what, what prompted the decision to go to USA Today? Um, well. You, Newsday had two editions, a Long Island edition and a New York edition. They folded the New York edition. Mm -hmm. They offered buyouts to staffers. Nothing wrong. The buyouts um, reached their point of greatest uh, financial reward for people who had worked exactly as long as I had worked there. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, this could be a sign. So I took the money and ran. Yeah, and you ran to USA Today. And, I ran to USA and then Today. USA Today ran out to uh, the to, to the Dulles Access Road. That's right. right. <laughs> do you, how often do you have to go actually work in the office? So we have a bureau downtown off okay. McPherson well, Square, and that's so that's where I work. Did you always have that, or when they first moved, did mm -hmm. you go out there completely? So when I started uh, 
uh, at USA Today, the headquarters were just across the river right, in Oslo. Right, right. We didn't have a Washington bureau at that point. Yeah. But before the headquarters moved out to the Dulles Access mm -hmm. Road, we opened the bureau uh, downtown. And I am, in fact, the only person who has ever held the job of Washington bureau chief at USA Today, because I, right. I was named Washington bureau chief when we opened that bureau. And uh, so I am now. You're doing and, something right, Susan. You'll be impressed. I am now the dean of Washington bureau chiefs. Oh my God! And you know what well, that congratulations. comes with? Congratulations. Longest serving Washington bureau chief in Washington. You know what comes with that? Absolutely, Absolutely nothing. nothing. <laughs> but you get to talk about That's it right. here. Yeah. But you know there is authority and responsibility with it, and you've also been an officer with the White House Correspondents yes. Association, right. and. I'm very curious, if Trump is reelected, and we see the way the White House press corps has been treated so far, the press secretary's job has been upended and changed substantially. There are no briefings anymore. The president has moved any aspect of press conferences basically out to the driveway. And he dominates and controls the agenda in that regard. What greater changes do you think will come if he's reelected? Well, if he's really, and do you worry about yeah, it? Yeah, I do worry about it. I worry about the fact that we've gone now, I think, 246 days without a regular White House mm -hmm. briefing. You know, those briefings, um, it's not that we don't have access, because we have unparalleled access to the president. We've never known so clearly what the president is actually thinking in real time as we do with Because president of Trump. Twitter. Because right. of Twitter, but also because almost every day he talks to reporters. Yeah. We've never had a president who is that transparent? Mm -hmm. I think President Trump deserves some credit for that. Yeah. Hey. Hey. <laughs> you know, it's it's not a bad thing that the president is talking to reporters about what he's thinking in real time. That said, it's not everything reporters need to know. And the role of the briefing, daily briefing, was to be able to pursue issues that when your hair is not on fire. Well, kind um, of deep dives into policy. Yeah. It, it was much more substantive than they have treated it like yes. it was. There was actually an opportunity for a s reporter working on a story to, to keep the press secretary right. on record for a number of questions. It wasn't just it wasn't uh, it wasn't just one direction. And also while I give the president credit for being accessible, his administration is less accessible mm -hmm. than any administration I've covered in terms of like can I get an interview with the national security advisor? Can I come, go in and talk to the domestic policy advisor? Can I remember who the domestic policy advisor is? Uh, you know, these are things that were very valuable in doing yeah. serious stories before, and it's just become incredibly difficult to do here. We hear we hear reports that the White House isn't nearly as staffed up as a typical White House would be. Is that no, true? That's right. It's smaller. Also, people have no um, seniority yeah. <laughs> because they keep getting fired. Right. right? I've lost count. What have we had? Six communications directors. Uh, Four press secretaries. Yeah. I mean, it's just. Um, How and, many chiefs of staff? Two, three? And, and only an acting chief of staff. Yeah. Now, you know, that all has an effect, too, because people, number one, don't know as much as they might know and also don't feel as secure as they might have otherwise feel if they had been in the job the entire time. Like, who has survived the entire time other than family members? Kellyanne. Kellyanne. So we've got and Peter Navarro. Oh, was he there at the beginning? Yeah. Okay, so we've got four people. Uh, two of them related. There's to the probably president. somebody whose name I'm Melania. Not yeah. Yes, oh, Stephanie well. Grisham has had different jobs, but yes, she's been. But she's been with, been there with the White House. So, but we are not yet on to a third hand, right? Yeah. With people, yeah, yeah. White House officials who were there from the beginning. Um, do you? Do you ever think a time could come, if he's reelected, where he'd move the press corps out of the White House? Well, you know, we came very close to that with the Clinton administration. Hillary Clinton, uh, in 1993, wanted to move the White House briefing room and press quarters over to the old executive office building. Mm -hmm. And there's an auditorium there, or something like right, that. Right, there's an auditorium, but I mean, it's you're Still, not you're, you're not you're in across. The, you know, you're in, yeah. you're you might as well be in Georgetown. Yeah. Uh, and, and I love Georgetown, but, you know, it's a long way away to cover three the White miles. House. And it was only because of a huge furor that that plan was prevented. Mm -hmm. So I think, pres I think every president would like to have put, be farther away from the reporters who cover him or her. Uh, so, yeah, I think that would be entirely possible. Um, so let's, um, one last thing, because you just did a story on her yesterday, Nikki yes, Haley. Nikki Haley. Uh, what do you think she's up to? She's running for president. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and is the way to run for president right now run closer to Trump rather than further away? Don't be his enemy, be his friend? So she has tried to walk uh, a line that no one has successfully walked, 
which is to maintain friendly relations with Trump, praise Trump, but also at times make it clear that you have some differences with Trump. So she's done this on a few things. When I interviewed her um, for an interview that was published yesterday, I interviewed her about her new book. Yeah. She said, for instance, that President Trump was wrong to ask the Ukrainian president for a favor in investigating um, Joe Biden and his son Hunter. Now, this may not, he, she didn't use like incredibly superheated language, but she did say that was not what you should do. No president should ever ask a foreign government to investigate an American, period. And that is creating, uh, that is a criticism of Trump that many Republican senators have refused to make. But she also goes on to say that she doesn't think it warrants impeachment, um, that she thought he was right on withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accords and withdrawing from the Iranian nuclear deal. And one sign of her good relations with Trump is that he has sent out a tweet urging everyone to buy her book. Uh, which, is, <laughs> which is an author. I would like President Trump to consider to, sending out a tweet saying everyone should buy Barbara well, Bush, the matriarch. Um, was a book. Did, every, want everybody to buy. I want every one of my followers yes, to buy a copy. Buy, buy the, what he did about this book was... Um, Denounced, not denounced, but criticized Barbara Bush as and the a grave. nasty old lady. And the grave. And the grave. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, um, what do you think? Uh, that's a wonderful way to transition to Barbara Bush, by the way. Um, if she were still with us, <laughs> do you think that she, how do you think she'd be advising uh, W41, um, President Bush 40, 43, I mean, um, to respond or not mm -hmm. respond to Trump? Well, she did not, and this will stun you. She did not like Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, we, yeah. yeah, I'm not and surprised. It wasn't, isn't it in your book that she had a, a clock oh, yeah. that was counting down yeah, yeah. to his last you know day in office? those countdown clocks that say, tell you how many days, Till the hours, end. Of, well, and there's one in front of the vice president's residence right. for each year. Yeah. So a friend of hers in the summer of 2017 in Kenny Bunkport got her one of those joke countdown clocks, yeah. which she really, really liked. And she put it by this little table she had in Kenny Bunkport where she would do needlepoint. And then when they went back to Houston at the end of the season, she took the clock with her. She put it on her bedside table so it would be the first thing she saw in the morning and the last thing she would see at night. And on the day she died, it was there. <laughs> so she was not a fan. Well, we know, right. Yeah. And, and she had all kinds of reasons to not yes. be a fan. Um, on the other hand, you know, her, Bush 41 followed a policy of not the criticizing. Club. The club doesn't the criticize doesn't, and, the newest member of the club. Right. And, and 43 has pretty much, I mean, there have been times when he's expressed his views on things. But I actually guess I think it's appropriate for presidents to be uh, reluctant to speak out about their successors. But not, guess, not impossible. There are times when he should do it. But I, I think there is a tradition that once you're out of the White House, you enter kind of a different stage of your But at this point life. in a presidency, three years, hasn't there been a time when all the ex-presidents are together and that really hasn't happened with Trump, is it? There isn't one of those iconic photos right. of the whole membership well, together. President Trump attended Bush 41's funeral. Right. Um, but he did not attend Barbara Bush's funeral. Right. Melania um, went. Melania went. There is that wonderful picture of all the former presidents at that occasion. The fact is... Not, but, but Melania, not Trump. But Melania, yeah. not Trump. So there hasn't been that picture so of him with all there's, of them. There's clearly some distance. I, I yeah. was at an event with President Carter earlier this year at the, a Carter Center event where he said that Trump had been, was an illegitimate president, that the Russians had elected him. And Trump then responded... Not the only one to say that. He's not, but he's a former president. Yeah, he is a former president. And... Yes. Trump responded to that by saying that Trump was a nice man, but a terrible Carter president. Carter was, yeah. Carter, yeah. That Carter was a nice man, but a terrible president. Yeah. Well, yeah, he d hasn't done anything to endear himself to the former presidents. Yeah. That, but yeah. it's just interesting to me. There's always that, that, that moment in a presidency where all of them are together. Yeah. You, you expect a David Kennerly photograph to right. come out, yeah. you know, and uh, none of that's happened. Um, you decide to do this book. Yes. And you have to approach her and get her permission. No. No? You no. could do it without it? So, you, are you, well, since we know you ended up getting her permission, yes. you were prepared to go ahead without it. So this was actually one of my big um, quandaries because I had, I'd of course, never done a book before. I didn't really know how to do a book. I decided that she would be interesting. Mm -hmm. 
Did but you know her at all? Was I there... had covered her. You know, I covered all these campaigns. But you weren't like. But I wasn't. No, no, we were not buds. best friends. Okay. In fact, my main experience was with her was her castigating me for working when my kids were young. <laughs> um, but so I'm thinking about doing this book, and I decide not to ask her or to tell any of the Bushes before I signed a contract. Because here's my reasoning. I wasn't sure this was the right thing to do, but that's what I did. <laughs> I, uh, I thought if I ask her permission, or ask, not her permission, but ask if she would cooperate, and she said no, that I might chicken out. And I was worried that if I asked her if she would cooperate before I signed a contract, and she said yes, that she th would think she had some control over what yeah, I wrote. Yeah, well, I can see that. Yeah. So I signed a contract, and then I sent three emails simultaneously to Barbara Bush saying, I've signed a contract to write this biography. I hope you'll let me interview you. To George W. Bush saying, hey, I've just signed a contract to write a biography of your mother. I hope you'll talk to me. And to Jeb Bush saying the same thing. Um, because all of them were people I'd interviewed mm -hmm. and were going to be important mm -hmm. to this book. And 30 seconds later, I get an email back from Jeb Bush that's three words long. It says, does mother know? <laughs> <laughs> so in the end, she let me do interviews. In fact, the last time I saw her. Did you get an email back from her? or did you Like get a week later. I had yeah. some conversations with her staff. Yeah. Um, at the last time I, saw, I did five long interviews with her in Houston. And at the end of the last interview, she gave me access to her diaries, which I had not expected. You interviewed her, but significantly, you interviewed what, 100 people? 130, about 130. Other and people. you and yeah. and how many of them were family members? How A many? lot of them. I interviewed her. I interviewed three of her sons. I interviewed her husband. The last interview, Bush 41 did with anyone. Mm -hmm. um, I interviewed cousins and uh, nephews and there are a lot of bushes yeah yeah she grandchildren she has she has a reputation and and you and you cover this brilliantly of you know being the sweet white haired <laughs> old lady but who's also as tough as rocks yeah but toughness has a price you yeah. you get this feeling that there's also an enormous amount of vulnerability first hit hard um, with the death of their daughter mm -hmm. When they, when they were a young couple, and Robin, and she was three, mm -hmm. four, three. Um, and, uh, and then later in the president, you know, throughout their official lives, it was, it was tough being married to Bush 41, wasn't yeah. it? So I think that, you know, one of the things that I think makes her interesting and complicated is that she had wounds that she didn't let people see. Mm. So you'd start with her very difficult relationship with her mother who favored her older sister and who um, nagged young Barbara about being overweight and left just a lifetime of insecurity about, about her appearance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, so she marries this man she adores and they move to... Who's Odessa. a dashing figure at dashing. that time. He was yes. dashing for a, a number catch. of years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they moved to Odessa, Texas. Mm -hmm. She is finally on her own, not in the shadow of her mother or her sister or her mother-in-law, all of whom were formidable women. Um, and then she starts this family, and her, her daughter gets diagnosed with a disease she had never heard of, leukemia. Uh, and the six months of seeking treatment at Sloan Kettering for leukemia with Robin was, I think, the defining experience of Barbara Bush's life. It made her much tougher. Mm -hmm. Uh, it made her care less what people thought of her. Probably makes you afraid too, though. It, but it made her. You're, it made you're, her you're aware that patient with prattle, you like I can't control. I, I don't things. care about. I don't care about my neck. Mm -hmm. I don't care about dyeing my hair. Mm. I don't care about people don't think I dress well enough, because I've endured this most this, serious yeah. thing. But it also made her more vulnerable, because it made her aware of how life can knock you around in ways that are not always fair. Did it make her raise her children differently, knowing that you can lose someone and have no control over it? Yes, I think it did. Um, it, it made her, you know, it made her especially close to George W. Because George W. was the only child, living child, who knew Robin. George uh -huh. W. was Robin's big brother. Mm -hmm. 
um, and no other, none of the other kids had an independent memory. He was also the one who was most like a bucking bronco, though, wasn't he? And the one who was most like her. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. That's that's. Um, she's tough. I, I think what's interesting about is that you know she didn't get along with Nancy Reagan, and you ah, go yes, into that. Right. And Nancy Reagan's often portrayed as tough. But Barbara was tougher than Nancy, wasn't she? <laughs> but in a different way. So they're both, they're both pretty formidable. Yeah, I mean um, that was never meant to blend, right. right? They they play, you know, and they but they played kind of different roles in their with their and they're both very important figures with their husbands' mm -hmm. careers, but in but in different ways they were they you know in some ways they seem so much alike they were born a few years apart. But Nancy cared they both went, entirely cared about so her. much about how she looked, uh, and. And what she could control. Um, right. And uh, Barbara Bush cared so much about her relationship with her family, with yeah. her children. Um, I think Nancy Reagan looked at Barbara Bush and couldn't imagine why she didn't do more with her looks. And Barbara Bush looked at Nancy Reagan and could not imagine how she had let her relationship with her children become so fraught. Um, did, they, did they ever make peace? <laughs> so their last conversation. Yeah. It, Barbara Bush told me about their last conversation in the very first interview I did with her, which means, which a story she had never told, which means she had been waiting like 50 years to tell someone this story, <laughs> right? I think it's possible she agreed to the interview in order to tell In order story. to tell you the yeah. story, yeah. And Nancy Reagan had, uh, on the day that Bill Clinton was inaugurated, right? so it's the worst day politically for George Dutton. H.W. Mm -hmm. Bush, right? They're yeah. flying back to Houston. He feels like a big failure. He hasn't won a second term. Nancy Reagan does an interview with Barbara Walters on ABC in which she criticizes the Bushes. <laughs> <laughs> and in unfairly, criticizes them for not being nice enough to Ronald Reagan, which was not true. Um, but Nancy had grudges. Nancy had, had a lot of, and she had done similar things in the past with the Bushes. So Nancy Reagan then calls Barbara Bush to try to explain it away, which this was a conversation these two women had had many times in the previous 12 years. And Barbara Bush first refused to take the call, then took the call the next day. Um, but you know, they were out of politics at that point, and she had had it. Mm -hmm. And Nancy Reagan starts to explain why she said this weird thing to Barbara Walters. And, and Barbara Bush says, I've had enough of your explaining. I don't want any more of your explaining. In fact, don't ever call me again. And then she did something that I bet we've all done. She said, oh, my other line is ringing. And she hung up. <laughs> now, in fact, there was no other line ringing. She just hung up. I have a feeling they, that was something. Go on. They never had, they, they saw each other at Nixon's funeral, but they never had another conversation. Another conversation of more than, hi, nice to see you at Nixon's funeral. Well, I have a feeling that's real Barbara Bush there. Is, and you know what's funny? She told me this story, like, with great vigor. Yeah. And then when she gave me access to her diaries, which she had not done at that point, I went back and looked at her diaries, and it has this long account that is word for word what she told of that, me. Of that, of that. This was obviously moment. pretty much engraved on her brain. Was it, was it Jeb she hung up on once? Didn't she hang up on Jeb? Yes, yes, What, she what hung was up that? What were the circumstances? I mean, I I'm sure that wasn't the only time she hung up on him, but, but it had something to do with an interview she'd done, right? So I think everybody will, re maybe everybody will remember this interview from 2013 on the Today Show, where Barbara Bush said, they asked, is Jeb running for president? And she said, well, there have been enough Bushes and enough Clintons. We should let some other families be president. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. So Jeb Bush is watching television. <laughs> <laughs> as his mother's being interviewed. And he sees her tell this. And of course, at that point, he's very seriously thinking yeah, about running yeah. for president. It is not helpful to have your mother say you shouldn't do it. <laughs> right. A so, national television. Right. So he calls her and says, what are you doing? And she said, well, you know, they asked me a question. And I answered it, which is probably true. I asked if she went in wanting to send a message to him. And she said, no, they asked it. Matt Lauer asked her a It was just what she felt, right? And that's what she thought. In fact, in, with the benefit of some hindsight, she was probably right. Americans probably were ready for somebody else to be president. So he says, don't do that again. And she said, OK, I won't do it again. <laughs> so then a couple weeks later, he's watching, Jeb is watching C-SPAN, an interview with his mother. And she says, you know, haven't we had enough Bushes, enough Clintons? Maybe it's time for <laughs> So she says the same thing. So he calls her, and, and now this time he's not just annoyed, he's like mad, because she had promised she wouldn't do it. And she got on the phone, she said, I didn't, he said, you promised not to say it again. And she said, 
I didn't, and hung up on him. <laughs> and he then called back, and she cooled off. And it turned out that this was a C-SPAN interview in that C-SPAN way they had done before the Today Show. Oh, I see. But they so. hadn't aired it because so it was she part had of cover. some series. So she, had, in fact, had said it twice, but not in the order Jeb had thought. I don't think Jeb found this very comforting, really, this no, 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 no. But then when she did get asked about this, she did try to say, well, in the past I've said this and that, but maybe there's, you know, she tried to walk it back. She, um, there was a dark side, too. She suffered from depression. Yes. And what was that, pro what prompted it? Or what did you, was it just chronic depression? Did she get treatment for it? How did the family deal with it? Because, I mean, I think we would remember that, that Betty Ford also mm -hmm. suffered from depression. Right. She dealt with it, as she's admitted, admitted many times, with alcohol and pills. Barbara Bush, I don't think, was prone to alcohol right. and pills, or not that's ever been um, revealed. But um, how, did, how, how did it manifest itself, and how did she deal with it? So there was a period of serious depression after Robin's death. Yeah. Uh, as you would understand. Yeah. And she credits George Bush 41 with getting her through that mm -hmm. and with refusing, you know, a lot of couples break up after the death mm -hmm. of a child, understandably, that George Bush refused to let her retreat, mm -hmm. it forced her to talk about it. Um, was, I mean, I think it was a, she was very grateful for what he did then. But she had a second serious period of depression in 1976. They came back from his service in China, where he'd been the top dipl U.S. diplomat. Um, he went to lead the CIA. Mm -hmm. He could no longer tell her about his work. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd really shared a lot uh, in the previous jobs he had had. Um, she had an empty nest. Her mm -hmm. kids were all gone. Uh, she was going through menopause. She thought that might have been uh, a factor. But for whatever combination of reasons, she fell into a serious depression. But there was another factor, too. Well, there's, there's another factor. There were allegations that her husband was having a long-standing affair, affair mm -hmm. with a staffer. Mm -hmm. um, that was also very painful for her. Should note that both Bush and the um, other woman deny yeah, that they always an have, yeah. but the rumors were quite mm -hmm. persistent. Uh, for whatever, with whatever combination of reasons, she became suicidal. Um, she told no one but her husband. Did um, she ever act on it, or just she, felt it? She told me in an interview that. She would be driving during this period. She'd be driving down the road and think about plowing into a tree, or driving down a highway and thinking about steering into the path of an oncoming car, and that she would have to pull off the road and stop and wait for the impulse to pass mm -hmm. before she then would drive on. So this was serious. Um, she says she never sought help from her doctor. Did not get therapy of Did any Did not kind. get therapy. She said that after about six months, she started to feel better. Mm -hmm. She said she wasn't, she told me she wasn't sure what made her feel better. She did note this, that she started to volunteer at a place that used to be called the Washington Home for the Incurables. I'm the chair of the board. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's now called, it's now got a better name. Well, it's called the Washington Home. The Washington, the Washington Home. Home, yeah, right. Washington Home for the Incurable sounds pretty harsh, but yes, that's what it does. It does. Yeah. It's like calling it the Washington Home for the Hopeless. Yes, but anyway, well, she, she went to volunteer there, and she said she started to feel better, and she thinks that may have been one reason why. Because she got a project, she got a hobby, so but to speak. But also, so you feel like you've entered a pretty rough patch. Yeah. Maybe find somebody who's in a rougher patch. Well, and you get outside of yourself. Exactly. It, uh, and so that was at what age was the, all of that? So that was, she was in 50s? her 50s. Yeah, because yeah. Doro, her youngest daughter, was then in high school, but had gone away to high school, so wasn't living at home. By the time they got into the White House, though, it was happy times for them as a couple, though, wasn't yes. it? Yes, yes. They had made well, peace. Well, he loved it, you know, a lifetime right, of ambition. Right, and they seemed to fulfilled. enjoy being there together. They seemed to, I, I really look back on them as kind of the end of an era mm -hmm. of a type of White House couple yeah. where there's a lot of entertaining, a lot of going out. Um, where they had a sense of the job. And friends. They had friends right. that were. They had a big network here. Lifetime friends in the city. She had, she had understood the value of the platform she had, mm -hmm. and she tried to utilize it. She said that Lady Bird Johnson talked to her um, when, before Bush ran the first time in 1980 about kind of the possibilities if you're first lady mm -hmm. and how you ought to mine them yeah. on, on behalf of things that you care about. Did she get along with Hillary Clinton? 
say they were not close. <laughs> was it was it the pain of losing? Was it you know or they're pretty different generationally. Yeah, I mean they yeah. like they're not that far apart in age, but in terms Did of generation. Did she have? Was there another first lady with whom she had a? Well, she really liked Lady Bird Johnson. She didn't like Nancy Reagan. Yeah. I, I think she liked Betty Ford. She she we talked about Pat Nixon once. She said that. Um, she said that she. We were. I was interviewing her, and she said, "Pat Nixon, did she drink?" <laughs> and I said, "I don't actually know, but yes, there. The rumors are yeah. that she was quite a heavy drinker." And she said, "Well, if I was married to Richard Nixon, I'd drink too." <laughs> <laughs> um, let's switch to uh, Nancy Pelosi for a little bit of time here, because uh, I don't know if this. I don't know if this has come up in your research, or if you've ever even thought. Did you ever watch the show Mad Men on TV? My husband did, so I would see it passing through the room. Well, there was a character named Peggy Olson. Yes. It was quite a dynamic yeah. character. And you watch her, you watch her, you know, evolve from being in the secretarial yeah. pool up to, like, being a master yeah. of the universe. And just coincidentally, well, I don't know, Peggy Olson had a Wikipedia page. And I don't know how I <laughs> arrived at this. But Peggy Olson and Nancy Pelosi were, like, born at the same time <laughs> and had this very same uh, comparable thread in their Wikipedia pages. Oh. And I always thought that uh, Nancy Pelosi is of that generation mm -hmm. that has transcended so many obstacles. Yeah. And had Peggy Olson been an actual real person, she may have ended up becoming, <laughs> you know, of Speaker of the House. <laughs> but um, I don't think many people know this about Pelosi. Maybe they do. She's, from, she's a local woman. She's yeah. from Baltimore. I often think it's interesting that Wallace Warfield Simpson, another very strong mm -hmm. woman, was from Baltimore, and she found her way to California. Yeah. How did that happen? So she does have this very interesting history. Her father, when she was born, was a member of the House. Dallas Dal 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 Tommy Dal Dalessandro. Um, became the three-term mayor of Baltimore, really a wow. legendary mayor of Baltimore. Um, she then, she went to, um, uh, she learned a lot from her father. Mm -hmm. uh, she learned a lot from her mother, who was a remarkable figure. I've done a lot of research into her mother. I found her really interesting. Nancy Pelosi went to Trinity here in Washington, uh, met a Georgetown student, as so many Trinity students do, <laughs> got married to Paul Pelosi. They moved to New York. He got offered a job back in San Francisco, which is where he'd grown up. They went back there, and the rest is history. Many, when she got elected to office in San Francisco, it, she was 47 years old, right? This is much later than most people I get started in wonderful. politics. Yeah. And I think people in San Francisco were generally unaware that she had, in fact, quite a formidable uh, political history mm -hmm. for herself and her family back here. It was in the genes. She is, she, is, um, she is an incredibly skilled politician. She is a great, you know what she is? She's a master legislator. Yeah. I don't think she'd be a great presidential candidate, but she knows how to run a but isn't that key to the job? I mean, does it, isn't that what separates the real masters of yeah. that job from the people who just happen to have the yeah. job? For her from Paul Ryan, for instance. Yeah. Paul Ryan would have liked to have been president. I think maybe his time will come around again. Um, I think Nancy Pelosi is into legislating. And I think the general assessment of Nancy Pelosi yeah. is that she is the best, the most efficient, most powerful House Speaker since Sam Rayburn. Um, do you think, you know, I don't know if, if you grew up with a hobby, um, maybe. Oboe. Oh, okay, there, yeah. oboe. And um, I, I think I could of, play, possibly. I think of yeah. sailing, and I've yeah. always felt, I, I came to sailing late in life, and I always felt that the people who'd been sailing since childhood were the, were the better sailors. Um, is that true in politics, too? You know, I think there is a, uh, I think some people are natural Pauls, yeah. even if their family wasn't. But I do think there is a depth of understanding if you've grown up watching some field of endeavor. Yeah. Isn't that why, it's, like, my best friend in high school became a doctor. His father and his grandfather were both doctors. Um, you find that with journalists sometimes, multi-generational. I think there is kind of a, an understanding kind of in your bones mm. for politicians like Nancy Pelosi. Um, well, to think of the kind of politics she grew up with, yeah. too, at the street level. Right. I mean, that really, I think that's, that's such a such a fundamental lesson in that that ultimately plays to the bigger stage yeah. when you get to it. It's relationships. Who's, who's closer than mayors yeah. to constituents, to interest groups, to donors, to whatever? Um, is this much like the Barbara Bush book, where you sign the contract and then immediately send her an email saying, yeah. oh, by the way, I'm doing this? Um, yes, uh, although this was, I thought, less risky because 
With Barbara Bush, if Barbara Bush had decided to not cooperate and to tell everyone else she knew not to cooperate, yeah. it would have been, I could not have done the book that I did. Yeah. It, I could have done a book, but it wouldn't have been as interesting. Uh, with Nancy Pelosi, you know, she's still in the mix. Yeah. Um, and there are, members of Congress are uh, more available than family members to talk to. Yeah. Um, but yes, I signed the contract. She's She's been cooperating. Um, I've been, I've had a series of interviews with her. I hope to have more. So. And you're going to interview another hundred people around her? To... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Does she enjoy the job? Yes. And does she, does she, does she ever talk about retirement? Have you gotten to any of that yet? So, you... um, I'm not to the retirement stuff yet. Right, um, right. But, you know, she's 79 years old, so presumably amazing, she'll retire at some it? point. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, because it, it, it doesn't show in terms of her... Stamina. In terms Ooh. of her... Will you, will you try to interview Trump about her for the yes. book? Yes. And uh, have you already asked for that? Do you yes. have... And you've interviewed Trump, I'm sure, yes. a number of times. And what's that like? He's very charming. Yeah. I think people don't understand. People who, especially people who are um, critics of the president, may not understand um, how charming he is, especially one on one. But he has control over that. Yes. He could choose to be charming he, all the time. But he's also, he? he's a, and he's a salesman, right? He's a, a realtor, so he's accustomed to, he's as salesman. he would say, yeah. you know, being able to make a deal. Um, he is. Uh, he, uh, He's interested, you know, I, after, I've interviewed him a couple times. I think he's smart and charming and um, uh, many other qualities, too. But Why uh, can't he forge a bond with Nancy Pelosi, then? Well, I, th I actually think they had something of a bond, but I think impeachment has severed it. Uh, you know, he, he's been very reluctant. He's generally not criticized her. Uh, and I think that... But they have these just, you know, hair-raising encounters, it seems. But where... I interviewed him just before the midterms mm -hmm. in 2018, and he has said he thought it was entirely possible they would be able to do some business with legislati legislation on infrastructure and other things. So I think, I think they have some... I think they've had some sort of relationship, although now impeachment has, I think, colored everything. <laughs> do you still play the oboe? I don't, but I still have my oboe. You still have your oboe. So if I chose to pick it back up, I right. do so. Uh, <laughs> but you, obviously it gives you an appreciation for music that probably yes. carries into... Uh... You know what else it did? Um, I think it's the experience I got from playing in orchestras is the experience that some kids get playing sports. Mm. I was really awkward in sports, and there weren't that many girl sports uh, when I was there. But you work as a team. You're good together or bad together. You want everyone to succeed. You know, I think there is an element of that that, that I took from playing the oboe. Well, um, good luck with all that. Good Thank luck you. with the Nancy Pelosi book. Uh, you. Make sure you get the matriarch. It's been great talking to you. I know you're going to leave here and go dive deeply into the impeachment madness. And good luck with that. Hey, and thank I'm you, so Karen. glad I know I'm you, so Susan. Glad. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you at the next Q&A Cafe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.